Sorry. There we go. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right. Welcome, welcome. We have everyone joining us. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to everyone joining us. We are excited today for the seventh annual Ola Shegun Agagu Memorial Lecture today. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon. For me in New York, good morning. We will begin in just a few moments. Please get settled in. And welcome to, to our program. Please make sure to follow us on Twitter. So the Agagu Foundation is on Twitter, is on Instagram, is on Facebook. Make sure to join the conversation there. Make sure to download your program, which was sent to you via email, and we'll be dropping it in the chat as well. Good morning from the UK. And welcome as we get settled in. Say hello also to the beautiful Agagu family joining us live from Lagos. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Great. Great. So please make sure to uh, tell us who you are in the chat. Please use our chat feature. Tell us who you are, where are you coming from? How do you know the, the fabulous Agagu family and the late Olashegun Agagu? We want to hear from you. Um, and uh, we will begin in just a few moments with our program. So thank you very much and enjoy some of the music from High Life. Welcome everyone. I see people joining us from Ireland. Wow. Uh, we have Indianapolis. We have, we have Lagos, of course. So welcome. Um, first, so um, as, as I said, my name is Liz Grossman Kitoyi. I am the CEO of Baobab Consulting and I'm going to be your MC today, leading us through this wonderful journey uh, to learn not only about the late Olushegun Agagu and the work that the foundation is doing, but also to hear from some amazing speakers. We have Her Excellency Rosalia Artiaga, the first female president of Ecuador, joining us today. We also have the renowned Ben Murray Bruce joining us. We have Bimbo Esho, the managing director of Evergreen Music. And we have artist Polly Alakija, who's going to be joining us and sharing all about culture and how culture can be a driver of progress. So thank you very much for joining us. Like I said, Please use the chat feature. I see it's live, so that's great. Please tell us where you're, where you're from. Tell us all about you, and we look forward to uh, getting started right away. So the first order of business is I would like to introduce Mr. Feyi Agagu, who is going to share with us just what uh, the foundation is doing. So welcome to uh, Mr. Feyi. Thanks, Liz. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, 
again this year. Thank you for, this, for coming to the seventh year Remembrance uh, Lecture. We're doing, we're going, obviously because of the COVID pandemic, we're forced to go virtual this year, which might not actually be a bad thing. Um, I'll just share my screen so I could go a presentation of what it is that we've been doing for the past seven years. Um, what our foundation is about, our mission, of course, my father's credo, to leave things better than he met them. Um, our focal areas have been in academia, geology, petroleum engineering, energy, politics, in particular, good governance, culture and arts, service, and of course, aviation trauma. These are, these are members of our board. So our chairman is Dr. Deji Adileke. Other esteemed members are Chief Pius Akinyerere, Mrs. Maria Pere, Prince Yemiade Fulu, who is also here with us, um, Alaji Kashim Imam, Ms. Shola Pedefala, Dr. Muiwa Liu, Aki, Mr. Akinyerere Joy, Mr. Kayo Defalo, who is far away in Canada, Uncle Femi Agabu, and of course, myself serving as the secretary. Um, Professor Dele Vawale stepped down in 2018. Mm. Uh, so far this year, we've uh, had about, this is our seventh one, so we had six uh, memorial lectures. Uh, we have existing uh, bursary and cash programs for different universities. We have endowments at four universities in, this, in the country. Um, university of Ibadan, of course, being my father's school. Uh, Ondo State University, Akumba. Federal University of um, Technology in Akure, and of course, the new Olusha Gwagagu University of Science and Technology in uh, Okitipopa. We also have uh, five scholarships um, at the uh, Yale, at the, the Adelike University. Um, for, for those going to secondary school, we do about uh, 30 bursaries of 50,000 naira each to students from the Southern Central District uh, in those states. We also have some students at Pema College in Jebu Ude. Of course, this is not enough. We're hoping to do more with the help from friends and family. Um, 2014, this was a highlight of our events. We had a, this His Excellency Festus Mugai, former president of Botswana, with us, of course, chaired by our grand patron of Olusha Gagagu Foundation, Chief Olusha Gagagu uh, Other notable people that joined us as speakers were former Minister of Communication and Technology, Mobala Johnson, about to death call Chief, Chief Olusha Okay. In 2015, we had uh, His Excellency uh, from to former President of Togo, Prime Minister of Togo rather, Chief Eden, Mr. Eden Kojo, supported by, as guest speakers, the current Chief of Staff to the President, Mr. Agwala Gambari, who was also our special guest there. 2016, we had uh, the, the late uh, His Excellency Benjamin Kappa. We lost him um, a couple of weeks ago. May so rest in peace as well. We also had a chief, but also other speakers there were Chief uh, Ashwaju Bola Tinubu, His Excellency Ambassador Ghana Kingibe, and of course, uh, always supported by Chief Olusha Um 2017, we had a uh, former president, uh, Joaquim Chisano from Mozambique, uh, was, we also been, we're lucky to have uh, it's the chairman, His Majesty Igwe. Uh, of your furniture with us. Other speakers were His Excellency uh, Kadi Fahimi and His Excellency Ernest Shoye, Shonekon. 2018, we had Her Excellency, first time we had a female uh, speaker, uh, Her Excellency Joyce Banda, and of course, other persons was chaired by His Royal Highness uh, Mahmoud Sanusi. Then other guest speakers were Ms. Chief Mrs. Polake. Shulanke first son, and of course, Professor Sheila too. And last year, we had um, Her Excellency um, Amina Faru Fakim, uh, Fakim Guru from Mauritius. Chief Mekanyaku was our chairman then. Um, His Excellency uh, Babajiri Songwulu was a guest speaker. We also had a goodwill message from Mrs. Ms. Amina Mohammed from the United Nations. And of course, Professor Bida Kobe also provided a Fantastic speech. Future initiatives, of course, we keep doing these lectures, trying to raise awareness, trying to raise funds. Uh, many things we've always we've always talked about the scholarships. Of course, we'd like to do more, and I think we can do more. We'll do maybe further in a couple of years. We we'll also like to have a compendium of all speeches from our great alumni speakers and some of the policy papers that have been suggested by them. 
um, some have even asked that maybe we should even consult, um, approve the concept of a memorial library. So some of this information that we've been gathering over the years, even from those from my father's library, will be able to put up there. And of course, we're also open to all sorts of initiatives, uh, other initiatives, essay writing competition, volunteer teaching and mentoring, uh, intervention and innovation study. So those are some of the things we'd like to do, okay? Uh, thank you very much. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Faye, for that presentation. So as you can see, the foundation and this family has done so much to drive discussions about policy, about leadership, and they're actually doing the work to make sure that more and more uh, young people across Nigeria and across the world uh, have access to these resources, to education and to culture. So, um, you know, just thank you to the entire family for the work that you do for bringing these amazing people together. Every single year doing this kind of a thing is very, is not easy. Um, and I've been honored to have been at the past two of the of the lectures in person in Lagos and this year doing it virtually while it is different and we definitely miss the feeling of being together. Um, it's really truly amazing even to be looking at, at this chat right now and seeing where everyone is coming from and everyone is able to join us for this amazing event. So uh, we, we, thank, we, thank, uh, we thank you for, for doing this every year and for your commitment. And today uh, is a special day um, and a special lecture because this will be the first time in the history of the foundation that we have had a dignitary coming from uh, not Africa. So we have a woman president. She comes from Ecuador, which is on my time zone. Well, one hour behind me, but still more on my side of the world here in New York. Um, and we are so excited to introduce Her Excellency uh, Rosalia Arteaga Serrano, who is the CEO of the Fidel Foundation and a truly dedicated leader um, to strengthening education and supporting the consolidation of democracy in Ecuador and around the world. So, uh, Your Excellency, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning uh, for some of us and good afternoon or evening for people that are in other parts of, of the world. I, I am happy to share with you the seventh anniversary of uh, Mr. Olosegun Agagu. Uh, he is uh, the uh, person that is motivating us uh, to be all uh, here, even this from this virtual uh, way. And uh, I want to thank you, the Agagu family, for this initiative. And also uh, to thank you, Liz Grossman, uh, because we met some time ago and she talked me a lot about the Agagu Foundation and what you are doing in the main issues that I'm also uh, very happy to share and to participate in this uh, uh, time. Um, I am a person dedicated a lot to education and cultural efforts. And I'm very happy to share with you um, and, and with the Agagu Foundation, these goals about culture, how culture can embrace uh, the development, and also how education how, uh, can make the difference. Uh, we just uh, know about some initiatives that the Agagu Foundation is doing, and how uh, these initiatives are changing the world, especially in Nigeria, but I'm sure in other parts of Africa and probably in the world. Uh, if we think um, about our lives, education makes the difference. The possibility to, to learn, uh, to study, to develop ourselves is so important because we can help the others with the knowledge that we achieve through education. I am totally motivated about the idea of the scholarships and what Agago Foundation is doing. Uh, going back to um, talking about uh, culture and education, uh, I used to be vice minister of culture. I really started my political career being the vice minister of culture. And after I developed to be the first female 
Minister of Education, Culture and Sports. Uh, myself, I am a, a writer and uh, I all the time think about what can books do for people. And I'm sure that we share uh, some of these ideas about reading, about preparing uh, small kids, but also teenagers and young people to lead uh, the institutions, to lead uh, the possibilities to go forward. Uh, well, uh, I, in, in cultural efforts, I know that uh, when we talk about local, we are uh, talking about the motivation that we as a town, a group, uh, uh, a culture can, can do and make the efforts better. The local is like the identity, the identity of people, the roots of people, the way that we behave, the meals that we prepare, the um, dresses that we are using, the uses that we, we do, the way to, to speak, the way to behave in, uh, in, in different moments. Then uh, the local is so important because it gives us our identity. The global, when we see what's happening in the world, um, we use some tools of global globalization, like, uh, for example, technology. Now we are using technology, probably without technology, uh, we never met uh, using this internet connection, but also we are waiting for a vaccine that is uh, uh, how we can uh, wait from medicine, from the advances in medicine uh, uh, to have a better situation in the future. And, and we talk about aviation. I, I know that it's some of the goals of, of the Agagu Foundation. We talk about aviation, we talk about communication, the radio, the television, the internet, uh, the medicine, how um, it, it is going on. Then we have the global tools in one side and uh, the local, that is the identity in other side. I used to play with words. The idea is how we can uh, play with the words and mix the words and mix the concepts because it answered to the real world, what's happening in the real world. Then uh, the word that I want to introduce to you is the word glocal. Uh, the mix between global and local, global. It is a neologism in terms of uh, uh, idiomatic expression, but it's also a mix of concepts because in, in the past we used to, to think that local and global are always fighting uh, and, and, and always, always in an opposite side. If you are preserving the local, how you can be global? If you are a global, a person, a global citizen. Uh, I remember one of the um, so sociologists from Canada, uh, McLuhan, talked a lot about the town, the global town, the global town, because he was thinking about how the communication was transforming our lives, and it is true. But in terms of preserving the local, the tradition, the dresses, the culture, the gastronomy, uh, the religions, everything that we love the most because it's part of our surrounders, is part of, of our, what our families are, are, are doing uh, from always, from a uh, long time ago, then we feel that global and local are, are in opposition and several times fighting. But uh, initiatives like Agagu family that are working on cultural efforts, I think that could serve perfectly to join the concepts and to join the words. That's the invitation to think uh, local, local. Uh, to, to use the, uh, these roots that we have, the traditions, how we do the behaviors, and also the tools that came from the globalization. Um, in, in terms of, because uh, people say it's how it works. Well, we know exactly how it works on environmental issues. For example, if we do something that is wrong in a mountain and we contaminate the river, at the same time, we are contaminating all the way to the, uh, on the way of the river to the sea, to the ocean. If we uh, burn uh, the 
uh, forest, that, like it's happening in, in Amazon, for example, in Amazon region. I know that in Africa you have also uh, big uh, forest, but in Latin America we also have big forest. One of the biggest is the Amazon, the Amazon basin. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve as the leader of an uh, organization, an intergovernmental organization with headquarters in Brazil that takes care of all the Amazon jungle, uh, the eight countries and one territory, the territory of French Guiana and the other countries, uh, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, Guyana, um, uh, Suriname, um, all, uh, and Brazil, of course, all this country has a, an organization that talk about the preservation of uh, the forest, but also the protection of the people that live on the forest. Some of them are, are very old tribes, uh, local uh, people that uh, live in the Amazon, live the forest, but also want to develop themselves. Then uh, when I was thinking about uh, the, the local issues and the global, I take the examples from uh, the forest and I say it is uh, good to preserve the forest, of course, but it's good also to develop uh, and improve quality of life of people. That's in the, in the area of, uh, of uh, environment. If we do something that is wrong, we are collaborating to climate change. We are doing things that probably are not good for us and for the others, and we have to take care of this. Uh, that is a way, uh, maybe a better approach than globalization, the local uh, circumstances to protect uh, our environment, to protect, protect uh, the place that we are living on. The other, I, I already say, is communication. We can do things in one side of the world and immediately we know what's happening in the other side of the world. Now I am uh, uh, here in Ecuador, in the middle of the world. My country has the name of, because of the Ecuadorian line, and uh, uh, talking to people in New York, to people in Europe, to people in Africa, especially in Nigeria. It is so important, the possibility to communicate that it demonstrates that the world is a global world. And in the other side, uh, the economy, because uh, in terms of science, uh, and, uh, we can't talk uh, about communication, about medicine, about everything. The other, the other issue is uh, economy. Uh, we know the economy is interlinked. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, situations that depends one from other. If there is a bankruptcy, bankruptcy in the United States, uh, it affects probably the um, uh, banks in other parts of the world. If China, is buying less uh, soja, soja products or is buying less in terms of commodities, it will affect the others. Then the interlinkage between economies is so important. It demonstrates again how uh, the vision of global is so important. I'm absolutely sure that the vision of late Olosegun uh, Gagu um, was a, a vision of a, 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 of a mentality that was in advance uh, going forward, foreseeing what's, happen what's happening and what will happen in the world. Uh, that's the reason that I think uh, Agago Foundation has uh, the roots very linked to Africa, uh, to Nigeria, but also seeing other parts of the world about studies, about education, about whatever we can do for a better quality of life of our people. Because I think, if, and you had several he, former heads of, of states in your uh, memorial days, um, that uh, each one of them uh, are thinking in how to do better for uh, our people, how to do better for the world. And uh, cultural efforts are always uh, very important. I was remembering when I was uh, vice minister of uh, culture and also minister of education, culture and sports, uh, what were the best efforts um, at that time to, to do um, something uh, that could be so important for people in my country. And, and I remember some festivals, for example, dance festivals, musical festivals, 
to have all this exchange because many times uh, economy can divide us, but, but culture, uh, culture means a lot for us. When I saw the music in Latin America, I can feel the roots of African music. When I, uh, I, I see, um, when I listen to uh, Brazilian music, or I, uh, I, I dance with the Colombian music, I feel the roots of Africa. Then the links between Africa and Latin America are so strong, especially starting from cultural roots. Uh, and they, it will be, uh, I think, uh, good to build more bridge between our cultures, more uh, relationships, because sometimes we feel that Africa and Latin America are so distant, but in terms of cultural efforts, we are very close then the invitation is to make it grow, to make it not only uh, something that came from the past, that so, but uh, also something that, that goes to the future, to our future. Many times we feel that Africa and Latin America had been like uh, discriminated, had been uh, uh, not a participant, not uh, good for inclusion with the other sides of the world why not Africa and Latin America work more together? Uh, we can open uh, the doors, open the windows, open the minds to make it possible. The possibility to think about these strong links between Africa and Latin America, uh, the roots, the cultural efforts can make the first step because uh, sometimes we are waiting for economic integration with uh, scientific integration, and probably it could be in the future, but why don't we can start because of cultural efforts? I'm absolutely sure that uh, Dr. Olosegun Agagu, the founder of this dynasty, the, the, the person in, in his memory that was created this foundation, would think, uh, uh, could think uh, about uh, this uh, situation and you, the family is prepared to do that, to, to, to make it possible to build relationships between Africa and Latin America. We can be um, uh, very far from in terms of geographic. Probably in the past, we were only one continent. Uh, the study says that it was only one continent and that Africa and Latin America fits perfectly together if you see the maps. Um, then we can build this uh, bridge to make it possible, to make these uh, uh, common um, interests, uh, these common cultural efforts being the stones, the first stones to build this good relation. I'm so happy to participate in this event and I'm, I thank you for the invitation I hope one day I could visit Nigeria. I had uh, in the past the opportunity, even last year, I had been in Mozambique and Kenya, and I had been in Ghana, in Morocco, in other countries. And I hope uh, one day I could visit uh, Nigeria. I know better than now the fantastic cultural heritage that Nigeria have and how um, the Agago Foundation is preserving this culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Wow. Uh, amazing, amazing remarks. And um, you know, one of the things that I was that I've been thinking about too, ever since we we did speak and I did mention <laughs> uh, the Agagu family, um, I'm really also, I believe in those links between between Latin America, between Africa, and between all of us. Um, we really do have an opportunity now more than ever to to create those links. Um, so I would just like to acknowledge uh, right now that um, the Deputy Governor of Lego State, Mr. Obafemi Hamzat, um, is, is here uh, representing the Governor, Mr. Babajide Sanwulo, who came here last year as a speaker. So last year he came presented and we're very, very grateful for, um, for the presence of the Deputy Governor. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, Your Excellency, we do have we do have a few questions that came from from the from the audience. So I would like to ask those. 
Um, okay. Oh, I've just been informed that the governor himself is actually here too. Welcome to the governor. It is nice to have you uh, in our virtual room again and for your presence and for all of your support uh, to the Agagu Foundation and to really driving culture uh, in Lagos and around Africa as well. I learned last year that Lagos is the fifth biggest economy in Africa. So that is a big, big job and an honor uh, that, that you can be here. So thank you. Um, Okay, so one of the questions that came through, I think you're going to like is, um, so it's about education as, and this comes from Anne Dankaro. She says, as global as the world is now, some of our educational standards and institutions are below par that we lose talent to developed countries. How do we bridge the gap in education and our economies to ensure a better quality of life for all? Yeah, it is a wonderful question. Uh, I remember because I used to be a teacher. I started when I was 17 years old, um, being a teacher in my own city. I'm the, from the south part of Ecuador. I'm not from the capital. Uh, now I live in the capital since I was in, in politics. Uh, but uh, I, used to, uh, I remember how to deal with the students, young students in a high school. Now, uh, I think we have an opportunity, an opportunity to use technology to, um, uh, surpass these uh, situations uh, that we already have in our countries, in countries like uh, uh, Latin American countries, for example. And uh, we are working very hard in how to, to bring the possibility to have connection because that's one of the questions, big questions, how we can uh, create a good quality of connections in our countries and also especially in rural areas and in uh, urban areas that are not developed. The other things is how we can have the tools like the devices. And the other thing, the most important thing is how to prepare teachers to be a distant teachers. Because it's not the same if you have uh, in a presential, you have a classroom with the students, you cannot have all the time uh, like looking to the screen and having seven, eight hours, the kids, the small kids, uh, like listening the teachers. We have to be more creative and we have to think that it's not possible to have all the hours, the small kids and the teenagers in front of a screen. Uh, the idea first is to prepare the teachers to be online teachers. Uh, myself, because um, I'm the leader of an NGO in Ecuador, I, I, we have a school for leaders from uh, young uh, adults uh, to be uh, the leaders uh, that uh, our country needs. Then I, I have to learn how to be an online teacher. And all my staff, like 20 people, we decided to go back to university to learn how to teach and to use all these platforms that we have, technology platforms, uh, to, to do it better. Then I think we have an opportunity uh, in our countries uh, working in three areas. First, uh, preparing and teaching the teachers. Uh, second, uh, more devices and uh, the, the help of NGOs and the help of uh, private companies uh, could be uh, very welcome. And third is connectivity. And connectivity, I think local authorities like majors, like the governors of the states can work better than in a national level. Then I, I make this proposal and I'm absolutely sure that we can make it better if we can organize ourselves. Great, thank you. Um, another another question that's come through is, um, you know, we we're again talking about local. We're talking about linking. What ways, concrete ways, do you see culture as being able to bring uh, to bring uh, Ecuador and Nigeria, Latin America and Africa together? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, at least I I mention mention some like music, for example. It is fantastic. When I, when I close my, my eyes and I am listening uh, music uh, from different sides of our continent, America, Latin America, I feel Africa. By, I, I feel Africa because I had the opportunity to listen to uh, African music and I feel that it's the same, that we probably have the roots because Africa is more older in terms of also in cultural efforts. Uh, then uh, we have a lot. But if, if we see painting uh, and we see um, 
and, and different arts, we see the same roots. Then uh, I, I think that a way could be to um, uh, make a research with some institutions like Agagu Foundation and maybe other uh, organizations in Latin America and in Africa to, to find the roots, the common uh, links between the arts in Africa and in Latin America. It is so important when you saw also literature, when you saw uh, what we are doing in sculpture, in painting and other arts, uh, the dances also, they, are, uh, they have some similarity. And I think we have to do more research and more exchange of groups. Uh, maybe now not because we have to do it all, always online, but we can use it also online festivals, online ideas to do it uh, better, the knowledge from one to each other. Great. Okay. Um, awesome. One question that just came in. Um, how well has Ecuador embraced the SDGs and how might, how, how, sorry, how might this have been able to work with the local cultural context? So in what ways has Ecuador, you know, achieved those goals and how has culture played a role? First, Ecuador is a very small country, uh, not as big as, as uh, Nigeria that I was so, uh, uh, watching some numbers about the population and the size of the country. Ecuador is one, is one of the smallest country in Latin America. We have uh, 18 uh, million of inhabitants. Uh, that is probably uh, as the size of Lagos. And uh, maybe um, and our territory is less than 300 uh, thousand of square kilometers. Then it's the third part of Nigeria, um, or, or less than the third part of Nigeria. Then um, uh, we are um, we are not doing so well in economy. Uh, it's a crisis uh, in in most of Latin American countries, and Ecuador is not an exception. Uh, but um, in terms of SDG, uh, we are taking care. Uh, Ecuador is working a lot to preserve the forest not only the Amazonic forest, because Ecuador, we have four different uh, geographical space. We have the Andean mountains that, were, that are, they are the uh, very tall, uh, biggest in, 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 in different parts of the world. Uh, we have also the beach, we have the Amazon forest, and we have an, uh, some islands, the Galapagos Island, that they are very important for science, for biodiversity, and all these areas, they are protective areas. Then we are doing a lot in terms, even being a, such a small country and not a rich country. Well, not a rich because of some politicians that may be bad, because we are rich in gold, in oil. Uh, we produce uh, the best roses, banana, cocoa plantations, uh, fantastic possibilities. But uh, in terms of uh, how is it uh, with the population, we, we are not a rich country. Then. Uh, we have to, to protect and, and, and to, to think about uh, what can be this kind of policies that we have to apply to protect the environment and also protect the development of the country. Uh, we don't have to fight between development and uh, preservation. We have to, to make an equilibrium between protection and developing. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm seeing lots of questions coming through uh, in the chat and in the Q&A, so thank you. Um, but we're only going to really have time for just uh, one more, um, just to keep on track in time. But we will make sure to get all of these questions compiled and send them to you and make sure that we'll find a way to answer them. Um, but yeah, I think the question I'd like to ask you, uh, this is from one of our participants who said, can we organize a, a cultural exchange between Ecuador and Nigeria? How can we make that happen? I can promise you that I, I'm going to work on it. Uh, okay. Maybe we can work with a Gagu family about how to make an exchange. Uh, first, uh, it has to be online because uh, uh, we cannot travel uh, until the pandemic is, we, we find a way to deal with the, with the uh, COVID-19, uh, but after it could be in presence. I promise to work, and if I found the, the, open, uh, the openness uh, on uh, the foundation and maybe Baobab consulting, uh, we can do more for um, this exchange. It, it could be, I, uh, myself, I'm a poet. I would be delighted to hear some poetry from uh, uh, Nigeria uh, and to exchange. I have the, my, 
one of my last books is about women, fantastic women that we had in Ecuador and in Latin America and made one poem for each of these uh, fantastic women in our history. Some of them uh, legendary females, some other in the history, but uh, for sure I can find fantastic ideas uh, to do in poetry about these uh, 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 very strong women in Nigeria. And uh, maybe we can, we can make it first that a kind of poetry, uh, po uh, poetry uh, exchange uh, about ourselves, what we are doing, and I'm totally open about that. Wonderful. So this is great. Thank you. Uh, the Agagu family, did you hear that? We have, we, we need to start planning this now. So we're going to have to make the Ecuador-Nigeria exchange happen. Um, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for this amazing presentation. I think everyone really, really learned a lot. And um, yeah, we would just like to say thank you. Uh, the Agago family, would you like to, okay, they're standing and oh, clapping. Uh, maybe a little dance, do we get a dance? Do we get a dance? <laughs> Okay, all right, now we got it. Okay, we can all thank dance you. and be happy. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, you. uh, for your time, and we will definitely uh, keep the conversation going. So thank you very much. Um, wonderful. So um, next up, we, are, we have another amazing, amazing speaker who's going to join us. Um, that is um, Ben Murray Bruce who is a business magnate and the founder of the Silver Bird Group. He has done so much in Nigeria. I think everyone knows, uh, you know, that he, uh, he founded the Cineplex, uh, the, sorry, the Screen Cineplex in Nigeria, Silver Bird Cinemas, the first Black Africa Miss World in 2001. We're very, very impressed and excited to have uh, to have Mr. Ben Bruce here. Uh, Mr. Bruce, would you please turn on your video and turn on your uh, screen now, if he is here. Mr. <laughs> Wonderful, is, hello. Can you see me? Is Brian Hammond doing this? We can see you, but we can hear you. <laughs> it's Brian Hammond, he's the one setting this up. That's Shalak uh -oh. So if this doesn't <laughs> work, is the Agagu family, not me. <laughs> He's in front of me. Okay. Can Wonderful. you see me now? Now we see you. Wonderful. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Can I proceed? You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, great respect for the Agagu family. Uh, Sheikh Agagu was my very good friend when he was minister and governor. And, and, and I love the family dearly, Governor Sean Wolu. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Last time I saw you was at an app festival. And uh, you're a very classy guy, so I like you a lot. And I think you're going to bring a lot of culture to Lagos State. And uh, next time I see you, I want to see you at the Africa Shrine with Femi Kuti, and I want to see you dancing with your wife. Uh, President Ortega, great presentation. Had a great time watching you. So let me explain to you. See, culture is important in the world, and, and, and I agree. But you need to understand something. Culture is like a relay race, right? You look at a hundred years ago it was European culture. Then it switched to American culture. Then it switched to South American culture. Now the world is talking about Africa. It's Africa they want to see, Nigerian culture, Nigerian music, Nigerian movies, Nigerian everything. If you notice, I skipped Asia because the world is probably not going to be excited about Chinese culture. I skipped Saudi Arabia and I skipped a lot of those countries because some cultures you can sell, some cultures you can't sell. Some people can appeal to you. Some people don't appeal to you. There's nothing you can do. It's not about who the president of the country is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are. 50 years ago, if you say black is beautiful, they said you're crazy. You remember, in the, in the 40s and the 50s, black artists played great music, but they had to put a white man on the cover because they couldn't sell the records if a black face was on the album cover. That was what happened at the time. If you, if you take Nigeria as an example, from the time we gained independence in 1914 to 1960, uh, the various things that happened. Nigeria is unique in Africa because I can't explain it, but the DNA of a Nigerian is different from the DNA of a Togolese, a Cameroonian, a 
and, 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 and the other African countries. For instance, in the 50s, in the 50s, the, the, the European heavyweight champion of the world came to Lagos. He was the, 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 the British Empire champion. He came to Nigeria. He came to West Africa, went to Gold Coast, which was, is Ghana today, he went to Freetown, which is Sierra Leone. And he said, I'll give you three guineas, three pounds and three shillings. If you can last three rounds with me, I'm the world heavyweight champion. He went to Gold Coast, he knocked out all the Ghanaians, he went to Freetown, Liberia, knocked out everybody. He came to Lagos and he said, Listen, I'll give you three pounds and three shillings if you can last three rounds with me. And I'm just trying, I'm, I'm giving you this example to understand the spirit of Nigeria. A young kid, skinny little kid got into the ring. He wanted three pounds and three shillings. He got into the ring, started shadow boxing, and he knocked out the world champion. This kid, this kid in Lagos, later on became the first man in the history of the world to become the middleweight and light heavyweight champion of the world in 66 and 67. His name is Dick Tiger. Okay, that is the spirit of Nigeria. You had Ogambasi, you had the Tiger. An American came to Nigeria once and saw a guy playing soccer, took him to Houston. His name, Akim Olajuwon, recognized one of the 50 greatest basketball players in the world. So, so, the spirit of Nigeria is difficult to explain. The first African to win an Oscar or a Grammy, whatever it is, is gonna come from Nigeria. It's not gonna come from Senegal. It's not gonna come from uh, Benin Republic. It's not gonna come from those countries. I don't know what the DNA is. What we have in Nigeria, you can't buy it. The spirit that we have, the aggressiveness that we have. I always tell people, we're talking about culture. There are two great nations in the world, two great nations in the world. These two great nations are populated by people with the same characteristics. They are brash, they are arrogant, they are conceited, they are crazy, they are loud, they are obnoxious, and the two countries are the United States of America and Nigeria. And these two countries, because of the way they are, these two countries are the only countries in the world that will sell their culture to the world. They will dominate the world with their culture. They're just who we are. We're crazy people, right? Because of the DNA that we have, because of what we drink and who knows what that is, we, we will come up with the next dance step that will take over the world. We will come up with the next movie star that will take over the world. In America today, we have more Nigerian doctors than African-American doctors. So it's not just about culture for, for the arts, to sing and dance or to jump and run and to knock somebody out in a boxing ring. It's just the way we are. So Nigerians will dominate the United States of America in medicine. There are Nigerians in NASA. They'll go to the moon, they'll go to space. There are Nigerians developing resistant drugs in the pharmaceutical profession. They are Nigerians in every sphere of life. And I'm not trying to make other nations jealous. One day I was talking to the former president of Ghana and he said to me, the Nigerian spirit is unbelievable. He said, my country, the people are gentle. Nigerians cut the line, they jump in front, they take charge, they fight, they quarrel. But that's, the, that's, that's who we are. That's the talent we have. But if you're building a house, don't get a Nigerian to lay the tiles. The tiles will be crooked. We are not good in the service industry. The service industry, forget it. If you get a Nigerian to lay tiles, it'll, the, the house will fall, the, the, the land will never be straight. We get a Nigerian to own the house, it'll be a terrific house. But don't ask him to lay the tiles. We must recognize culturally across the world that the certain talents we have and certain talents we don't have, we can't have everything. Like I said, this is the relay race. Leg one, Europe. Leg two, North America. Leg three, South America. Remember, just think through the last hundred years. There was a time, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, all the music, all the beauty, everything in the world, everything you thought about came from Europe. Then he switched to North America. And Americans were having a great time. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, American companies started buying South American companies. They started buying South American radio stations, South American TV stations. And what happened? There was an explosion of South American music. All of a sudden, it was South American music. And if you look at the pageant industry, in the last 20 years, check all the winners. It's, it's always from Colombia, Venezuela, Nicaragua, all those countries. So are you telling me that South American women all of a sudden 
are the most beautiful women in the world. 20 years earlier, it was North America. 50 years earlier, it was Europe. And now, and now, and if you think of South America, how come they're recognized as having the most beautiful women in the world? Mixed blood, okay? Your next beauty queen is not gonna come from Norway. Your next beauty queen is not gonna come from Sweden. There's too much in breeding. That's not gonna happen. Now, the world is looking at Africa. All the companies want to invest in Africa from a cultural point of view, from an economic point of view, from materials beneath the earth, and from the sheer zeal and excitement we bring to the world. And when you come to Africa, when you come to Africa, remember, it depends on what your investments revert. If it's a service industry, it's going to be in South Africa. It's going to be in Ghana. It's going to be in Togo. If it's manufacturing, if it's, about, if it's about that Nigerian spirit, then it's gonna be in Nigeria. If you wanna make a lot of money, you're gonna make more money in Nigeria than any country in the world. We have free spirited people. So you ask the question, what has culture got to do with this? A lot. It is who we are since 1914. It is who we are. I gave examples of Dick Tag, I gave examples of Akim Olajuwon, and give examples of stationary stores. By the way, uh, Governor, you don't have a football team in Lagos. So after this, I'd like to start up a football team. Uh, we call it the Agagu uh, football team, Agagu Babes. And they'll play at the Unicorn Stadium. And we're going to win the Challenge Cup, OK? We're going to win the Challenge Cup and the Africa Cup. I used to be a fan of stationary stores. And I had a seat at Unicorn Stadium for about five years. I was there every day. And I'm glad you're fixing the stadium. So Agagu United, we're going to have a football team there. And I'm going to be the manager. So get ready. now. We, if, and, 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 and take Nigeria as an example. If I was to put a football team, I will put the Yorubas in front. I'll put the Yorubas in front, the attacking. I will put the Hausas and the Igbos in the defense, and I'll put the South South in the middle. People say, why do I put the Yorubas in front? Because they're an exciting race. They will dribble, they will dance. They're exciting, they will score the goals. I'll put the Igbos and the Hausas at the back. When you want to score the goals, they'll break all your legs. So that would be a good team. And the South South, people, South South people in the middle. There's something special about us. And I'm telling you. So if you look at pageant, for instance, we don't have queens from the North. If, because there's, from a cultural point of view and from a religious point of view, the girls cannot participate. If they participated, we win this world in universe every single year. So sometimes, so, so there's certain things you can't do. Take Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a beautiful country but it's a repressed economy. And therefore, there'll be very little creativity in Saudi Arabia. China, 1.4 billion people, 1.2 billion people, I don't know what the population is, but because it's repressed, superstars are not gonna come from China. That's not what's gonna happen. Nigeria is a free country, regardless of what people say. It's a beautiful country, it's a free country, it's a great country. The next superstar will be a Nigerian. Guaranteed, without a doubt. The next the next Grammy Award winner will be a Nigeria. The first African, black African to land in space will be a Nigeria. The richest man in the world will be a Nigeria. It is going to be Nigeria because of who we are. Governor, you may say, what do we drink? I don't know. Why are we like this? I don't know. Togo is next door. They don't have that talent. Ben is next door. They don't have that talent. Ghana is next door. That talent don't exist. South Africa is around the corner. That talent don't exist. It is who we are. It is why we're an exciting people. It is why Nigeria is the happiest people in the world. And it is why Nigeria will dominate the world in whatever we choose to do. Thank you all very much. Wow. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, as an American, I definitely feel, I feel it, you know, like we're a little crazy too, um, but I yeah, think- crazy. Yeah, I, I, I love I love I love Nigerian music. We're hearing it all the time here. I'm in Brooklyn. And now when I'm listening, like a car is parked and I'm hearing Burn a Boy like that is yeah. now what is happening, um, even in terms of fashion. Um, you know, we're all looking to Africa to to provide us with that culture. So it's really exciting to hear that. Um, 
And uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for your remarks and for sharing. So we are, we are going to let uh, people ask you questions, but we're going to wait until the end um, once the rest of our guest speakers have also given their remarks. So if you have any questions, please make sure to ask them. But um, for now, I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Bimbo Esho to give her remarks uh, as well. So um, yes, Ms. Esho, are you, are you here with us? Hello? Okay, Ms. Esho. Hello. Okay, do we have, do we have uh, Ms. Esho? Does anybody, yes, there we are, wonderful. Okay, so thank you very, very much for joining us. Next up, we have the fabulous and wonderful Bimbo Esho, who is the Managing Director of Evergreen Musical Company Limited. And I am really excited to hear more about your story, um, about the work that you've done and the work that you are doing. So thank you and welcome. And you are on mute, so let's make sure to, wonderful, great. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be here. I hope you can hear me. Yes, perfect. Um, it's nice to be on this platform. I've been enjoying uh, all the participants and uh, I must um, congratulate the Agogo family for all the things they are doing and taking up their father's legacy. It's, uh, it's uh, very rare in this part of our world to see children that can take up their father's legacy. So I must say a very big thank you to the Agago family for what they are doing. And particularly, Mr. Fayida has been communicating with me. I must say it's a very good uh, privilege meeting you. Well, um, the platform is a very good one. And uh, like uh, the moderator said, that she want to know what we have been doing in Evergreen. Evergreen Music is the largest uh, collection, collectors of music in Nigeria. It was, um, put together by my dad, Mr. Femi Esho, who since the age of 12 has been collecting most of the works of uh, the living legends. And today we have the largest works that you can ever think of, over 100,000 vinyls is what we have in our repertoire. And it's something we have been putting together. I mean, he is now, is uh, about 75 now, and started doing that at the age of 12. He himself is more like a museum, if you ask me. And yeah, we're talking about uh, our cultural values and how uh, culture can, I mean, be used as a medium for progress. Yes, uh, we, we all, as uh, humans, we have a, a culture in our uh, bloodline, and it's one of the vibrant um, things that any society can have. The Nigerian music, as uh, just like uh, Mr. Ben Bruce said and uh, our president said, there is nothing that can connect anybody, any tribe, any religion, any, I mean, name it. You have that music connectivity. And since 1914, we have been collecting uh, the works of uh, the great uh, giants of this uh, country. From 1914, we've had uh, the likes of uh, Ray Walede Dengue, I mean, those are names that a lot of people might not be familiar with anyway. We've had the likes of really what they did get. We've had the likes of uh, uh, people we call C.S. Balogun. We've had Sunday Nightingale and Indep Bakari. You know, it's only through the collection of such music that the generation that uh, are today, I mean, we're talking about a hundred years music and you can feel this, you can still feel the signs and the, I mean, the content in the music of today, you can see that the only changes is in the instruments and all what, what have you. But today, we can boast as the largest collections of uh, music. And it's also interesting to see that the present generation are borrowing from the past. In most of their musical uh, rendition, you can feel that uh, most of our proverbs most of our idioms, a lot of things are all uh, as a, as a continuous embodiment of uh, the music. And you know, these are the things that can showcase 
cause to the world. Like the president earlier said, she said uh, one heart that what are those things that, uh, you know, connect her to Nigeria. One of the things she said was music. There's nowhere, and just like uh, Dr. Ben Bruce also said that, I mean, we are happy people. We love music, we love our culture, we have high life, we have a kala, we have juju, we have different kind of music journeys, you know. And uh, a company like, like ours has been doing everything within the path to be able to preserve all this music. Because once you don't have a culture, you don't have a background, you might probably not even know where you're going. You know, so um, it's a good uh, opportunity. And I remember, you know, when uh, Chief uh, Agagu was alive, he was such, I mean, he was so passionate about music. And it was so, you know, till date, I tell my dad that if we have a lot of people like him in government, I mean, the, the way the industry will move in terms of uh, culture, in terms of uh, music, our hearts, it's going to be very, very am uh, amazing. So we need a lot of people like, uh, I mean, people that are genuinely passionate about music and our culture in our government. And looking at him, he has, I mean, he has proven everybody wrong to, I mean, people that say that uh, maybe some government people don't care about the culture and all that. No, there are still some of these people that are so passionate about the culture, especially the music of uh, uh, their, the society, you know, they come from. Like someone like uh, Chief Shagwa, I remember one day when he called my dad, I said, he was asking for a particular song by Cross Del Juba, and it was so amazing that, and that was in the midnight. So you can see the power of music, and you can, you can see the genuine love and passion for music. There was even a time also that, um, the Honorable uh, Minister uh, called me from Abuja, you know, he wanted some, you know, he wanted us to put together some songs in the past, the meaning, who sang it, what was it for, which year was it composed, why was it composed, you know, those are the things that, you know, and when you feel this kind of music, you know, you can feel you can feel everything about us, the culture, the general way of life, our dressing, our food, our lifestyle, in most of the songs, you know, it's such, uh, I mean, we all have to really, really genuinely open our hearts to embrace our culture. And I'm so happy that just like uh, the president said, she talked about the uh, Boma boy. I mean, he's doing well, he's, uh, he's representing us well, like, you know, I mean, uh, Nigeria, uh, many people might be seeing us like someone oh, and all that. No, we have a good, we have beautiful people in this country that are very creative, that can really have a, a good representation of who we have. It's not everybody that has uh, the negativity all around uh, whatever. And you would know today that one of the things that has really taken us to the world over today is in our music. And in those days too, we, I mean, we had a lot of bands the likes of uh, KSA, the likes of Chief Commander Ebenezer Obi, they represented us very well in many concerts abroad. You know, those are the things that have driven the attention of uh, Nigeria to, I mean, to the outside world, just like uh, Mr. Ben Bruce too, what he has been doing with the beauty pageant, it has taken us all over when the likes of uh, Bani Derogo won uh, the, you know, all those things are things that we need to preserve. You know, we, we need to preserve it. And the only way we can do it, just like uh, Agabu Foundation is giving this platform. I mean, it's very, very impressive. I must commend this effort. It is so impressive. So we need a lot of uh, people like that that can, I mean, put up a foundation, put up a concert, use their platform to define us properly. Because culture is a lifeblood of a vibrant uh, society. So there's nothing we can give to the world aside our culture and for us to really define and represent ourselves properly in the high of the universe. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for your remarks and we're greatly appreciative for, for you joining us and for all the work that you do to, to spread culture, like culture, the music, Film, all of that is what unites us and it's what is really going to bring progress, not only just to, to Nigeria, but to the world as a whole. So we're very grateful. 
Um, just as a reminder, everyone, um, please make sure, you know, we're hearing all these wonderful things about the Agagu family and the foundation. Please do remember that you can support uh, the foundation. There is a link that you can donate whatever you have that you want to contribute to this dialogue, to helping them continue this kind of work that they've been doing for the past seven years. And also, you know, to make sure that you know, students get scholarships and that and that this cultural progress can be continued and replicated and scaled. So thank you again. Um, make sure make sure to click that link and and give uh, give a donation be a supporter. So thank you, Ms. Esho. So um, next up, we will ask uh, Ms. Pali Alakija to come and share a bit more about her work before we bring all of our speakers back for that Q&A. So please make sure to drop the questions that you have in the Q&A and um, you know, keep, keep on sharing and, and chatting. So thank you, um, uh, Ms. Alakija. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and thank you, Liz, and thank you for the introduction. Um, it's an absolute honor to be invited and to be a part of this event this afternoon. And a huge thank you to the Agagu family and everything that you're doing. Um, yeah, culture is a driver for progress. Where do I start? Um, I want to go back to the beginning of this event and the quote um, of Dr. Adag uh, Agagu. Um, who wanted to leave things better than they are. Um, and I want us to think about that. Um, before I really start, let's, let me just define what we're talking about. Um, there's these two words, there's culture, there's art, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Um, and they're usually put together in one phrase. We have the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, but really what is the difference between culture and art? Um, if you ask people generally, you know, what is art and what does art mean to you? It tends to intimidate people. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not artistic. I don't understand art, it's too intellectual. So art is sometimes this rather nebulous space that a lot of people, feel they need deep, deep knowledge to understand what that art represents. Um, and I'll completely agree with them that sometimes, yes, art can be a bit mysterious. But culture, if you ask anybody out there, ask anybody on the street, what is culture to you? You will get an immediate response. And as Ben Murray Bruce has just said, culture, culture is who we are. So it's easy to define culture. Culture is how we live. It's how we celebrate. It's how we get married. It's how we bury our family. Um, it's how we party together. Um, it's how we express how we feel about each other. It's how we educate our children. It's how we look after ourselves or each other in times of crisis or in, um, it's how we um, look after our health service. All that is relevant. All of that is culture. Um, but then the art and the artifacts. Um, art and artifacts is very much a reflection of civilizations, of cultures. Um, if we think about um, culture over history, civilizations over history, if we go back, let's go way back, let's go to the Greeks, the Romans, let's go back to the Egyptians, let's look at Nock culture, let's look at the great Renaissance in Italy, let's look at the great Benin kingdom. How do we um, judge those civilizations and those cultures. We judge it through the artifacts that are left behind. Um, and so we tend to form a one-sided opinion, or we can, can tend to form a rather one-sided opinion of a civilization and culture through its artifacts. Um, artifacts tend to be the result of people who are able to invest in artisans to produce things of glory that tend to celebrate who they are. Even if you think about here and now, who actually has the ability to invest in art? Um, it tends to be something that the elite are able to do. And it very much reflects who they are. If you think about our banks, for example, I can't thank the banks of Nigeria enough for the support they give to arts and culture. The art they collect very much is a reflection of how they see themselves. And it's also a statement this is who we are, we have arrived, and we're going to support you in return for that. Um, so art is absolute reflection of culture. Um, and it's something that people of influence have access to. Um, and the elite tend to have more access to than the general populace. 
But art and culture is always used to influence how people behave and social behavioral change is done through culture, is done through the arts, for better and for worse. So again, let's go back to history. And um, what were the Greeks and Romans doing through their art? They were trying to manipulate their audience. What were the Renaissance doing? Um, the Medici family used art to influence and to change how people behaved and to ensure that their power was reinforced. Um, we don't know enough, sadly, about the Nock culture to be able to say the same about the Nock relics that are left behind. But we can be fairly sure that it's a reflection of the, the culture practiced by the elite. Um, so let's jump now to where we are here and now and look at what we're going through right now. Let's look at 2020. 2020 and what are the two big issues of the day right now of course it's the COVID-19 um, pandemic and also the other big movement of the year has been the Black Lives Matter um, with the COVID pandemic um, elsewhere in the world clearly the BAME communities have been the communities most adversely affected by COVID-19 um, and that's a result of generational um, imbalances. Um, and then of course, you can say the same thing of Black Lives Matter. How are we going to change those narratives? How are we going to change the way we look at those um, two issues and make a difference to how people behave and the measures that we're going to take at all levels. We're going to do it through culture. Culture is absolutely the tool by which we're going to change those narratives. Um, and I'm so glad that I've learned this new word, glocal. Your Excellency, thank you so much for putting that word out there. I'm going to be using it a lot because COVID Black Lives Matter, these are global conversations. How are we gonna change those conversations? We're gonna change it in communities. We're gonna change it at grassroots, in our schools, with our children. Um, so it's absolutely local and it's global all at once. Um, I wanna just run through um, to kind of illustrate um, one of the issues we're up against. Um, in changing the narrative when our educational system is sometimes falling a little bit short. Um, there's an exercise I do. Those of you who know me know that I'm somewhat passionate about education and I try and use arts and culture to educate about key issues. Um, and there's a little exercise I do when I go into schools or if I'm working with teachers or young people, and just call it here and now. And typically in Lagos, I'd go into school, um, I'd be working with um, teachers and I'll ask them, okay, can we just stop where we are right here and now? And I want you to describe what you see around you. And then I ask my children and the teachers, let's go back, let's go back five years. What was around you five years ago? Can you describe what you see? And then we keep going back in time. We go back 50 years time. We go back 100 years time. We go back to 1851 when there was the bombardment of Lagos. What was happening um, in this environment then? And it's frightening to see how few um, children, teachers and youth can tell me not just about the social history, but the natural history of the place. And then we flip that and then we move forward in time. And then, then I, I throw it out there to the kids and the, the teachers, I say, okay, let's move forward five years in time. What will this environment look like in five years time? What will it look like in 10 years time, 50 years time, 100 years time? Now, if these children and young people don't know about the culture and the histories of their past, and haven't learned those lessons, how are they going to imagine their better future? So I wanna go back to the words of Dr. Agagu, who wanted to leave things better than they are. And I would challenge everybody to please support our youth and our young people in helping them make the world a better place through education and through exposing our, our young people to arts and to culture and to history. Um, I want to just, um, before I finish, um, reach out to Your Excellency, uh, Excellency Rosalie Artiega um, about the fact that you're a poet. Um, I run an arts education initiative. Um, we work with children and teachers across the country and throughout the COVID pandemic, when the schools have been closed, we've continued working with our teachers who are in communities. Um, and we're running an online poetry program with an awesome Nigerian poet 
who's in California, and she's been working with our teachers. These are primary school teachers and um, developing their poetry skills and encourage them to find the confidence to tell their stories in their mother tongue through poetry. So we've got a whole cohort now of awesome primary school teachers who know that they're poets and they're busy now taking those skills into the communities in, and to the children that they're working with and um, communicating with teachers in California and in London and in New York and across the world and in the di diaspora. So please let's find a way to run a beautiful program between teachers and poets, please, between Nigeria and Ecuador. I think it'd be really stunning. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just going to jump in because that is the perfect segue to welcome all of our speakers back. Um, even Her Excellency is still here. So please, Your Excellency, uh, please join us. Um, uh, Ms. Mr. Bruce, uh, Ms. Esho, please join us so that we can have a conversation about this. Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for staying. Um, and now let's let's get uh, let's get Mr. Bruce and and uh, and Ms. Esho back as well. Uh, but what do you think, uh, poets? Po poets education, Nigeria, Ecuador. Sounds like but, sounds like we're leaving the world a better place than the way we found it today. Uh, I would say. So how are we doing, Agagu family? We all we all happy? We great? Okay, wonderful. Uh, we have Ms. Esho back, thank you. And now, uh, Mr. Bruce, are we here? Or are we coming? You, wow, you gotta tell me. You, you gotta wonderful. tell me. We don't see you yet. Um, but what a wonderful panel of women to look at. Wow, so always, always great to see women, women leaders uh, together. So, Yes, um, I guess the first the first question that I'll kind of kick us off with is, you know, how would you describe the role of culture in legacy and identity building um, for the younger generation, but also, you know, for for everyone? Um, I'll I'll ask. Uh, let's let's start with Her Excellency first. Uh, so tell me about culture and legacy. Thank you. Well, uh, first I want to to take the. Uh, idea of uh, Polly about uh, some exchange about poetry and uh, education. I'm totally open. I love to. I would love to do that and to maybe bring uh, or build the bridge between uh, countries uh, with poetry and education. It is fantastic idea. Uh, the other is uh, especially for young people. It's needed to know the roots. It is uh, uh, impossible to create strong big countries. Uh, without the roots. I know that Nigeria is doing a lot with uh, uh, film uh, because it had a big film industry and uh, it would be also fantastic to learn more about uh, this film industry and how they improve it, the quality also, because it's not only to do uh, an amount of films, but also to do something about quality and uh, how uh, the, the cultural efforts can be together and uh, of course, uh, it will be great uh, to work on some initiatives with uh, Agagu Foundation and other uh, in initiatives uh, to do more for, uh, for humanity. Because at the end, it is human beings that we have to build a better world with, for human beings. Wonderful, agreed. Does, um, would anybody else like to react uh, to the question? Yes. <laughs> You're not going to hold me back on this one. Okay. Um, legacy, absolutely. Um, and I just want to, uh, I don't know how I can keep this brief. Um, Nigeria has this incredible ability to leapfrog. When you think we're stuck and we can't move forward, we suddenly leapfrog the issues and become uh, the global leaders. And I really pray that we manage to do that in education. Even before the pandemic, um, we were looking at what are the skills that the 22nd century is going to look for in education? And those skills are about community, caring, and culture. It was all back to the community, and it was all about caring, and it was all about identity. So we'd already started talking about storytelling, about storytelling in mother tongue. And what we have in Nigeria is we still just about are holding on to our tr traditional oral um, traditions, but just by a thin thread. Now, if we can hold on tight to those traditions and leapfrog 
and ensure that those traditions become part of um, mainstream education. We're going to leapfrog to the 22nd skills and identities that we want to develop in our children. Um, so legacy, but actually making a difference and making yes. the world a better place all at once. And that's actually um, yes. one of the questions that came in from Ms. Uh, from Ms. Esho, um, I guess about legacy building, but also about preservation. So what mediums has your company adapted in preserving ancient music before recent technology came? Well, um, you know, because uh, the way music has been in Nigeria is, uh, I mean, it started from different kind of uh, musical equipment. You know, you had the reel to reel, you had the cassette. You know, those were the early generation of um, recording uh, music, a uh, medium for recording uh, music. You had the vinyl. So, basically, as a collector that I said my dad was, you know, starting from the age of 12, for the start collecting the reel to reel, he had the vinyl, he had the cassette. So, the general, as the gradual preservation is m moving gradually also with the technology. As the technology comes and uh, progresses, we, we also uh, move with the tide. You know, later we have the CD. So at a point we put all our works with the copyright from the family of the owners of the music. You know, we put them on CD. And the way we also package our works, we have it in a music comp uh, musical compendium format where you also have a comprehensive biography about this musician. So people can actually come to the office and they can pick uh, a complete work of fella where uh, Mr. Ben Murray Bruce who was the chairman when we launched it. You know, we put all the works of fella and Nicola put it together so that the young generation, people that are coming, when we are no more, they can also have access to it. We still have that available. We also have the works of uh, Chief Commander of Benizo Bay. And when you talk about preservation, we had to make it mandatory that, sir, you have to preserve your works for the generation that is going to come because your song contains a lot of things. Do you want to talk about Nigerian history? You want to talk about uh, many things that have happened? You want to talk about stories, about government, about anything you think about, you know, you find it in the compendium. And he has the largest collection in Nigeria. He has about 660 songs. I don't know who's going to beat that record sometime soon. You know, so such things, we preserve them, we put it in a compendium format too, you know. So now, moving also ahead of technology, again, we are talking about digital uh, world. So we are gradually moving into that, trying to build a platform where at the touch of a button, everybody can have access to any kind of music. Why also the family of such great icon can also have access to the works and the sweat of their uh, their fathers. So that's what we have been doing. We are just we have been preserving, and while we are preserving, we don't only stand as uh, preservators of uh, uh, culture or music. We also try to promote, and that's why we put up events. Sometime last year, the last event we had is where Ariye Kovic was sponsored by the Lagos State Government. You know, and all this thing is in a bid not to uh, to ensure that the legacy. Our music doesn't die because if not for the fact that uh, people like us and some other people have been collecting those things, I really don't know what uh, the generation of today will fall back on because you need to go back and say, okay, look, which kind of music were, was in existence? What can I take from it? And you know, many of them have been doing it. Even in many of their repertoires, you can see the songs of old artists. You can see what Simi is doing. You can see what a lot of them, they are doing with it. You can see what Flavor, who does I like, is doing in his own time. And you also, you can see the gradual, um, you know, it's not like, culture is not, it can be uh, static. So you can see the gradual movement, you know. What I like was in those days is not what it was, it is today because everything is changing, the beat, the sound, you know, the interest, the generation you have today is so different from what it used to be. So everything is changing. But in terms of preserving the works of all these icons, we have been doing our best. And we are hoping that we can uh, do something bigger for, yeah, I mean, when people like us, we are no more to the, our lives today, we want to set up a foundation whereby people can have access to it, like an institution, you can learn about your music, you can learn about who sang what in 1914, who sang what in 1916. You can learn history from most of this uh, music. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really interesting and it's really important work. Um, 
yeah, just keep maintaining the records and the history. Um, it helps you to have something to build on. And the more we do now, the better off we'll be later. So that's amazing work. And thank you for that. Um, so one question that came in from Mr. Bruce. So this is from Ambassador Olumoko, and he said, agreed, Nigerians have vivacity, vivacity and creativity, but how can these qualities be made to define Nigeria positively rather than negatively? Well, this is a, this is a question that is commonly asked across the world for any culture. So the, the best example I would give is the United States of America, your country. At the turn of the century, when you had John Wayne and the cowboy movies and so on and so forth, if you look at all those old movies, there was racism in America, the blacks couldn't vote, women couldn't vote. They had those black and white movies. When the, those black and white movies were made and sent across the world, and those black and white movies were made, and you see John Wayne on a horse, you'll see a little kid, he'll save the little kid, he'll save people, he was kind, he was generous, he was positive. It made America look like an amazing place to visit, to live, because the movies showed America as a compassionate country. That was what the US government did with the movie studios at the time. Now, what the Nigerian government needs to do with a movie producer is say, okay, now, there are two kinds of movies. Movies that make money in the box office and movie that promotes the government. The government should start investing in movies that promotes the country. Governor Sean Willow is there. He can say, okay, all right, you're making a movie, it costs 100 million there. I'll give you 20 million there, or 25 million there. Make this movie. And in the movie, let the world know that Lagos is an amazing place to live, a safe place to live, a beautiful place to live. That movie is shot, sold across the world. It's going to be seen by hundreds of millions of people over the next 50 years. I Love Lucy, shot in the 50s is still sold today. You can buy a series of I Love Lucy for $300. If you go to CBS, you can buy I Love Lucy for $300. Sholu will live to be 95 or 150 years old when he's gone. The movie he pays 25 million to a producer today will be so positive about Lagos Day, his great grandchildren will say, wow. This is what government needs to do. In, 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 in France, you have a cultural center, same as Germany. There must be a, it must be an arm of government. They never come out and say, this is the propaganda movie. All they do is they come out and invest in the movie in such a way that it tilts the direction of the movie. It's still commercially viable, but it says positive things about Nigeria and our people. If the government does not do it, what's gonna happen is, Producers will only produce movies that make money. And you know, there's a formula for making money. Okay, and I don't want to use those words here. In America, you blow up cars, you have sexy women. You know, there's a formula for making movies. And that's the formula used across the world, across the world, it doesn't matter where you are. Now, in addition to that formula, the governor, the president can say, I'll give you a little bit of money, not too much. It's enough to seduce the producers, they'll make the movie, they'll, pro they'll, they'll project Nigeria positively, they'll project the states positively, they'll project our culture positively. If they don't, there is really no incentive for the producer to spend his money to promote Abia State or Lagos State or Bayasa State or Imo State. He's not gonna do it because you're not paying him to do it. Thank you. Um... Excellent. Um, okay, so I think we have time for just one more final question and I'll let everyone answer this one. Um, this one comes from Yemisi Ransom Kuti, and that is, how can we best tie culture to economic development, promoting local lifestyles, local content, et cetera? So um, who wants to be the first to, to take that one? I'll take it. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, 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 culture makes money that, uh, uh, all over the world. Tourism makes money. Hollywood, movies makes money. Dance makes money. Soccer, play, don't forget it. When Pele was playing soccer, I can't they call it the Zynga. The way they dance with the ball made money. When I was in school, there was a kid called Haruna, Ileka, Haruna Ilerika from Zumratu. He could dance with the ball and score goals with the ball. He was a tourist attraction. Harna Rileka from Zumratu Islamia Grammar School was a tourist attraction by himself. Sonia Day can make money. 
fella Nicola Kokuti can make money. I say, hear me, Sikuti, I'm assuming uh, this is uh, one of fella's relatives. I don't know, I know a lot of them. I don't know which one this is. However, so the Africa Shrine, the president of France came to Nigeria, went to the Africa Shrine. That is a tourist attraction. We can do incredible things to make money. And guess what? The things we need to do to make money don't cost a lot of money. That is the irony of our life. Okay, let me give you a typical example. The Eiffel Tower in Paris. It was built how long ago? How much did it cost? People come all over the world to look at the piece of steel. What is the Eiffel Tower? It's a piece of steel. People come all over the world to look at a piece of steel. Does that make any sense? I mean, you leave your country, get on a plane, land, stay in a hotel to look at a piece of steel. Well, hey, if they can put a piece of steel in the center of Paris, they'll put a steel, piece of steel in the Atlantic. Now, governor is here, let's make Equa Atlantic a tourist attraction for the world. That is the biggest development on earth. That is, that is a city built in the Atlantic Ocean. Governor, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, you're going to be there jogging with me. We're going to attract everybody there. We're going to make Equa Atlantic the most incredibly beautiful, sexy city in the world. If he takes me up on that, we will make a lot of money. Wow. That is a that is very true. It is a big piece of steel. And I had never really thought about it like that. But that is very true. Um, yeah, and I'll come to the inauguration of the Eco Atlantic piece of steel uh, when that happens. So please uh, don't forget about me. Uh, I'll be there. Um, great. Okay, so anyone else would like to talk about tying culture to development? Polly, yes. Um, Yamisi, thank you so much for the question. Um, You've given us a very easy question to answer considering your family history. Um, but just a quick, quick nod of acknowledgement to all the individual artists globally who are really suffering as a result of the cuts in funding for the arts. So as, as Ben Bruce just pointed out, so it's about the individual. It's about that creative brilliance from, of that one person that lights a spark, that has the idea, that is completely committed to what they're doing and passionate about what they're doing. And that individual doesn't care about the money they're making. They're passionate about the excellence of what they're doing and they focus on that. And the knock-on effect develops an economy and develops a whole ecosystem around it. And of course, there's no greater example than Fella. Um, Fella, what did Fella do? I don't think there was one point in Fella's life where he was concerned about making money. He was passionate about his message. He was passionate about his music. And that's what he focused on all his life, but we are still feeling the economic benefit of his awesome music and the results of his brilliance and his passion. Um, so it's about protecting that individual talent, allowing that individual talent to thrive and blossom. Um, and as we all know, around the world, millions of those brilliant young people, brilliant creators are really suffering because <coughs> the effects of COVID-19. So we need to find a way to keep supporting that individual and creating empowering environments that let them thrive and prosper. Wonderful. Uh, um, I want to add uh, something. Uh, first about mother tongue, uh, because it is uh, so important to do cultural efforts in mother tongue, but also um, uh, in a country like my country, Ecuador, we have Spanish, uh, as the official language, but we have a lot of other languages that uh, were uh, used and has been used uh, for a long time ago from different native uh, people. And um, we have the Quechua and many, uh, many other languages. Uh, I remember that I was in the Ministry of Education. We developed a bio bilingual project uh, to teach the, the kids in their mother tongue. It is so important because it's part of their culture. Uh, it's part of uh, their identity. That's one thing. Uh, and I'm totally uh, fascinated by these uh, cultural mother tongue efforts. The other thing uh, is uh, to talk about cultural industries. It is so important because uh, some of you say something about making money with culture. Of course, we can make money with culture. And the, the cultural industries, they are so important. You develop the uh, film industry, and it is uh, not, not only the question of making money, but also how to develop identity, how to export identity, that, how to uh, show the other people of other continents, of other parts of the world, 
the richness of the Nigerian uh, culture, the richness of the Ecuadorian culture, then I'm uh, really delighted with this, this talk, this conversation, and I'll, I also read some of the questions about Nollywood, about all the things that are uh, people of Nigeria is very proud and uh, reasonable proud. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm thinking seriously that I have to visit Nigeria and to follow more closer the efforts that Nigerian people and the foundation like uh, Agagu Foundation is doing. Uh, my congratulations for this nice dialogue and the importance of talking about culture because a lot of people think about economy and other things but not about culture but culture is so important that I, I really you feel my heart of good intentions of good ideas about uh, the issue of culture thank you very much Thank you. Again, the Agagu Foundation, leaving the world a better place than, than, than we left it. Um, this conversation, yes, um, has really been amazing. Uh, Ms. Esho, would you like to just add one final, uh, one final yes, thought? Um, yes, yes. Um, um, I mean, if I look at it from the point of uh, the music part, uh, which I am very into, I think I would say if we can put up uh, a lot of uh, festivals, a lot of concerts, a, a lot of people are dying from all over the world to come and see the kind of music we have. You know, you see, what is happening today is more of a youth going to the outside world to showcase what we have. But we want a situation where people can also come here, more people can come here to see that seems that I mean we also have a lot of things that is uh, around a lot of kind of music a lot of kind of musicians a lot of kind of things beautiful lovely good sound that a lot of people are craving to have a feel you know so if we can actually get a platform more platforms uh, to be supported by I mean our government corporate and uh, well-meaning uh, Nigerians you know we'll have a lot of concert and we'll be able to promote and showcase more of the people that are doing a lot of uh, good uh, music in our climb, you know, we'll be able to showcase them to the world. I think with that, you can also see what is going to uh, generate in terms of uh, internal revenue, even for the country, you know, it's just like, uh, there has to be a symbiotic uh, relationship and also a cultural exchange as it were. So I, be I believe with that, more concerts, more events, festivals and all that, we can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our amazing speakers. I am just, I'm really, really blown away by everything that I've learned today. Um, even from the perspectives of people coming from the chat, thank you for making this event very, very, very exciting, lively, timely, relevant. Um, and we're really happy to be here. So I would like to invite, um, I would like to invite uh, the Agagu family. Uh, so we're going to have uh, Prince Adefulu, who is a trustee of the foundation, to come and, and wrap up, uh, say a few last words. Uh, and, and we will also have a brief moment of silence and memorial as well. So um, let us get the Agago Foundation family up here. Yes, wonderful. Well, um, Your Excellency, um, um, Rosalia Ortega, um, our cultural icons who, who are here today, um, uh, Mr. Shaw, uh, Ben. Mary Bruce, and Polly Lakija. I cannot thank enough for all that um, has transpired today and all that we have had. It's very interesting that um, we have gone back and forth, and um, we always came back to what my friend, Shegun Agago, 
after whom this foundation is named, uh, live for and work for. To live, to make Nigeria better than he made it. And uh, that has, we've gone back, the theme has always gone back to that theme that he lived for. Uh, Rosalia Tega, I appreciate all that, um, all that uh, you know, you spoke on culture, on education, uh, and uh, how you would like to see further relationship uh, between Nigeria, between Africa, and your country, you know, Ecuador. Uh, it was very interesting to hear uh, Ben Boy Shaw, you know, go back uh, many years, uh, far beyond her years, to that time when her father started a collection of uh, Nigerian music. Um, uh, since uh, the father, who is now about 75, uh, who is about my age, he started a collection in, um, uh, since he was 12. And um, that really is, uh, was, is a lifetime of uh, dedication, of uh, continuous, you know, uh, uh, commitment, you know, to, to art and to, you know, you know collection. We had, we had uh, uh, Mrs. Elakija uh, talk about, um, about uh, knock culture about um, uh, what culture, you know, really means, uh, um, you know, the way of life, of um, how the family is raised, a family is brought up, the kind of values, you know, and, uh, and so on that, uh, that they live for. And when people talk about culture, they really don't think too much about these things, but that's what it's, it's, uh, it's all about. And... Uh, uh, ben Murray Bruce, um, typically, you know, breaking it down and talking about Nigeria, the Nigerian culture, the Nigerian people, uh, the very essence of, uh, of Nigerians and, uh, and who they are. Uh, it's what one American friend of mine calls the horsepower of, uh, of Nigerians and irrepressible, you know, kind of, uh, you know, people. And uh, he mentioned Dick Tiger, he mentioned Hakim Olajuwon, he mentioned um, um, he couldn't, modesty did not allow him to mention himself. Uh, because, <coughs> because in a way, that's also what, um, you know, what, you know, he has been doing, you know, culture, um, strong, uh, you know, people, and irrepressible people. Um, he himself has been bringing up superstars in uh, in the area of uh, beauty pageants, you know, and uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have had a wonderful day. We have had wonderful contribution. We've heard about the Nok culture, about the Medici family. Uh, we've looked back a long a long way, and we have been blessed really by quite a number of uh, people who came forward to be a part of this event. Apart from the speakers that we have referred to, uh, we have had close to 350 uh, people who have um, tuned in from all over the world to be a part of, um, of this, um, of this uh, uh, event. And um, uh, certainly, I'm sure there are a lot of, there's a lot of lessons that uh, we have learned about legacies, which is what the Olusha Gwangagu Foundation, you know, is all about, trying to preserve, you know, legacy. And Ben put it very, very uh, succinctly when he said, hey, what's so great about, um, about um, uh, steel structures? You know, put together in the center in the in the center of Paris, which we all go there to go and see. And when you look at it, 
it's obvious that as difficult as things are in Nigeria, we have a lot to be proud of. We have a lot that we can put together. We have a lot that we can bequeath to the world. And the French president came visiting Nigeria. And where did he go to? He went to Fela's um, Fela's <coughs> um, um, you know, place. And uh, he's, he stated how Fela, what an influence Fela had on his life. So I'm sure that when we look around, uh, we find that we have had many relation in cars. Maybe not many. We have had relation in cars. We have had Mrs. Um, Fula and some Koti. We have had uh, Ben Murray Bruce and his illustrious father who was a uh, tremendous you know, businessman. And there's uh, so many other you know, you know, people. Now we have Polly Alakija and all that, uh, the tremendous amount of work that uh, he has, he, she has been doing. And of course, we had the benefit of the company of um, the governor of Lagos State uh, today, who uh, was a uh, speaker last year and a participant you know, this year, and his deputy, um, Hamzat, and many illustrious people who have tuned in from all over the world to be a part of this event. I want to say to you that we, uh, the family of um, Odusha Gwagagu and the members of the Board of Trustees are greatly delighted by your attendance, your tuning in. Thank God for technology that we can bring all of you together from all over the world at one and the same time, united in the pursuit of culture and united in the pursuit of the legacy, which my good friend, um, Olusha Mwangagu, lived for. And uh, even in his death, we have not forgotten that. And he was a great lover of music. He was a great lover of art, uh, from particularly from the musical you know, you know, perspective. And uh, we thank you for joining in this. We thank you, Liz Grossman, all the way from New York, you know, putting this, you know, tidying this up, you know, so neatly. <laughs> thank you. We're, we're, it's always an honor to, to, even though I was never blessed to meet uh, Dr. Olusegu Nagagu, I feel like I know him just based off of you know, you and the work of the foundation and the legacy that you are preserving is truly, truly amazing. And thank you for your remarks. And before we wrap up, um, I would like to see if Sholape uh, Agagu Hammond could come and lead us in a, in a moment uh, of silence and commemoration of uh, the life of this wonderful, uh, wonderful icon, father, business person, politician, professor, the list goes on. So thank you very much, uh, Sholape. Thank you very much, Liz. And thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful, emotional, heartwarming, hilarious event. Thank you very much, Uncle Ben. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so very much. It was wonderful and encouraging listening to you. And we shall certainly be doing a lot more with Ecuador. Um, Polly, I'm getting a cut of whatever it is that comes out of that. Um, so <laughs> on to the slightly more serious bit. Um, on the 16th of February, 1948, 72 years ago, a star was born, one of the greatest ever, as far as I'm concerned. Like the star that he was, he blazed a trail, illuminating all that he touched and every life that he met. And as stars do, he passed on from this plane seven years ago, but we still see his light. We feel his warmth and we celebrate his legacy. I invite us all to rise for one minute to honor one of the greats, our own Dr. Olusegun Agagu. Dr. Olusegun Kokumo Agagu, CON, beloved husband, father, grandfather, brother, friend, leader, and inspiration.
May his soul rest in perfect peace. Amen. 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 And thank you very much, uh, Sholape, for that. And, you know, on, on this final note, uh, commemorating the seventh annual uh, memorial lecture, honoring such a wonderful man, um, I just want to say thank you to, to, to you all, to, to everyone for coming, everyone for participating, for, you know, for the entire Agagu family, for dedicating yourselves so selflessly also to the preservation of your father and of all of the wonderful things that he's done. Um, it's truly unique. Um, and, and you as a family um, and as a community are just um, I've never met anybody quite like you, um, and it's really, really an honor just to, to have been a part of this journey with you um, for the past three years, and then especially on this one, um, this year, this very, very special year uh, for the whole entire world. Um, but I would also just like to remind everyone that, you know, the work that they're doing, um, you know, they, they, are, they are doing it themselves, and they must help. Um, the work, bringing together this type of an event, making sure that students have access to education, making sure that knowledge is preserved is not easy. So please, please do um, consider making a donation. Um, it, you, can, you can donate via the link that we've been sending out through the chat and we'll be following up with more information about the programs. Now that you've joined us here virtually, um, we'll be adding you to the mailing list so you can make sure to keep updated on all of the activities that they're doing. Um, but um, truly, I just would like to say thank you um, for, for continuing this journey um, and for doing everything that you do um, as, a, as a family and, and for Nigeria, but also for the world. Now you have Ecuador here. Uh, we are not forgetting that. Um, next year, who knows uh, where we'll go and where we'll be. But um, thank you very, very much um, to, to everyone um, for for, for joining us. So in that light, we're gonna throw on some high life playlist music so you can feel free to stay, hang out, dance. We do know that uh, that Mrs. Agagu is quite the dancer. I don't know if she'll be getting up in front of everyone to do it, but um, please uh, feel free to enjoy some music with us. And we actually have a Spotify playlist for those of you who have access to Spotify. I am not sure um, where in the world we're all tuning into, but we will also be sharing that. So thank you so much for joining us. And yes, celebration time, wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Oh. oh, almost. Yes. Can we hear? What is the number?